simple answer, of course, to does Britain have a European strategy is no. And I could sit down there um, while remarking uh, that if one were to ask, does Germany have a European strategy, does France have a European strategy, let alone does Italy have a European strategy, the answer would be much the same. That's part of the problem of European integration at the present moment. But what I thought I would do is, is try and explain the context in which uh, the British are now sliding around the issue of what our position in Europe should be. We have, after all, in the last few weeks had uh, a speech by David Miliband, which was the most positively European speech that a British minister had made in several years, so positive that lots of us, me included, and I was there, thought this is his bid to be the, uh, the high, new high representative, but then he said he doesn't want to do it. We've also had David Cameron's response to the final ratification of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, repositioning the Conservative Party, or at least attempting to reposition the Conservative Party. So things are moving uh, at least on the surface. The problem we face in Britain at the present moment is that we are clearly in a, an end-of-government mood. Remarkably uh, reminiscent for me of the period in 1996 to early 97, when the, the major government was drifting towards its end, rather exhausted, bad-tempered, inside the government, uh, waiting for the last possible moment when he could have an election. Well, we're doing that. We know now it will be on May the 6th, 2010. And a great many decisions are being put off until after the election. So the, the drift of British European policy is part of a larger problem of the drift of British foreign policy as a whole, which has several dimensions. First of all, that the whole concept of Blair's foreign policy, which Peter Riddle famously labelled hug them close, you know, get as close to the United States as possible and then hope you have some influence over the United States, has now broken down. The Obama administration has made it very clear, and in particular clear to the Conservatives who went and visited Washington some weeks ago, that they are interested in a relationship with Europe and not with Britain. And with Britain as part of Europe, and in particular, they're not interested in having a close relationship with a Britain which cuts itself off from its European partners as the Conservatives in Britain risk doing. So the, the essence of British foreign policy over the last 10 years or so, the whole concept of liberal intervention, the sense that Britain stood close to the United States and therefore stood taller in world politics, has come unstuck. And of course it's come unstuck for a range of other reasons as well, that the, the doctrine of liberal interventionism, which Tony Blair uh, propounded in his Chicago speech, which then appeared to be so successful in Kosovo, a major operation in Sierra Leone, a very minor one, then led on to the second Gulf War in Iraq and now Afghanistan. British armed forces are heavily engaged in a long-term operation and taking relatively heavy casualties and large question marks again come up over all of that. The costs of Blair's foreign policy, which was that he neglected relations with our European partners, in particular with France and Germany, are also now much clearer. So that's a context which any new government would have to grapple with. Then there's the whole question of British defence policy. It's now nearly 12 years since our last defence review, and there is consensus among all parties that we have to have a new defence and security review starting in June 2010. So kick it off to after the election, but then we know that a lot of things have come unstuck and we need to readdress them. Britain is the third largest spender in terms of GNP in NATO, in defence, after the United States and Greece. Uh, we've been spending 2.5% of our GNP on defence compared to only a little over 1% in Italy, 1.5% in Germany and 2 and a bit percent in France, and we are now realising that that is not enough to manage all the defence commitments that we would like to cover. We have a, a forward projection on defence procurement, which simply does not add up. There is an argument as to whether it's 24 billion short 
or 35 billion short, but it's a very large sum. So we, whether we can afford to place our current nuclear deterrent submarines or to build the two aircraft carriers to which the government is at least officially committed or to buy the next generation of fast jets or long-range transports, there are some very large questions there. The Blair government started in 1998 by launching at St. Malo European Security and Defence Corporation. It was very much a Franco-British development. We were distracted from that by everything that happened in 2001 and afterwards, but our officials and our officers were also disillusioned by the process of ESDP, in which, so it seemed to them, defence ministers would come to meetings in Brussels, sign up to lots of commitments, go back home, and their finance ministry would tell them, you can't do it, and they'd say, fine, sorry, we can't do it. Um, so, uh, again, the British are stuck in defence terms, recognising that we cannot continue the way we have been, that we are approaching a very large crisis, and we're not sure where we go from here. In uh, a major speech which William Hague, the Conservative foreign policy spokesman, made in the summer, he said, this is not an East of Suez moment, meaning this is not comparable to that period in the mid-1960s when the British finally came up against the idea that they could no longer pretend to be a world power, keeping troops in Singapore and Aden and elsewhere, and had to cut back and be more modest. Of course, the fact he says it isn't an Easter Suez moment means that he knows it is. It's that sort of crunch point. Um, then there's the, 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 the huge problem of what I would call the national narrative, the sense of who we are and what sort of country we are, uh, which is rooted in public opinion, but is also recycled endlessly in the media. Now, one level, one looks at public opinion polls, Europe is not a terribly important issue. Most of the public are interested in crime, housing, education, jobs, particularly in a recession. But at another level, the sense that Britain is special, Britain is exceptional, Britain is separate from Europe, is very deeply embedded and hasn't yet been challenged. Our great sort of national symbolic day each year is November the 11th, Remembrance Day. And yet again this year, Remembrance Day was celebrated in Whitehall by a parade of British troops and British veterans with the impression that we stood alone in 1941-45 and eventually defeated the Germans. Um, in Paris, you may have noticed, for the first time, the French president invited the German chancellor to join him uh, in commemorating the Second World War. They've moved on rather more in their national narrative than we have. Tim Garten Ash once referred to the whole debate about British foreign policy still as being footnotes to Churchill, by which he means we're still stuck in the reformulation that Churchill made at the end of the Second World War um, of the English-speaking peoples, as Britain as still a global power, Britain and the Commonwealth and Empire as still of global importance alongside the United States, friendly with Europe, but separate from Europe. The problem with that for the Conservatives is that the symbolism of it, the Spitfire, uh, the, the, the War Memorials, etc., are easily taken from them by the UK Independence Party and by the BNP. I was looking at some BNP leaflets only a couple of weeks ago, sure enough, Spitfires stuck all over them. It's, it's the, the image to which everyone goes back. And until we begin to redevelop a different sense of national identity, which Gordon Brown has spoken about, sometimes at length, but never actually managed to shift on, we're not going to be able to get away from this dreadful narrative. Um, so if you ask people in Britain what they think about the European Union, on the whole, they're pretty negative. Um, last spring's Eurobarometer had British opinion as the second most negative in the entire European Union, behind Ireland. Um, the Irish, Irish opinion has now shifted, British opinion has not. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the way the media 
and most Conservatives responded to the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty, I was also struck by how little the debate has moved on the last 20 years. The reference points was to Maastricht, or that thing, a social chapter. Um, a federal Europe dominated by France and Germany. No sense that the EU now has 27 member states rather than 12. That social and employment legislation has dried up within the European Union in the last 10 years. But again, recycling the myths of a previous generation. Add to that the economic crisis, which we now face, after a period in which, yet again, the British felt that we were more successful than the continent, that the German economy was in long-term decline, failing to adjust to services, bogged down in old-fashioned manufacturing, and that the service economy and Britain as a financial, global financial centre was the wave of the future. Now, in London, as in Dublin and elsewhere, we are discovering that things are not quite as simple as that. Sterling has declined by over 20% against the euro. We are in a deeper recession than France or Germany. The Anglo-Saxon model does not look quite as good as it did. We've had to nationalize a great many of our banks. And that potentially alters public assumptions about Europe. It would take some time, but I think it, it, it may. I always used to say to people from abroad who asked me, and when will Britain join the euro? My answer would be, not until the German economy has grown faster than the British economy for three or four years. Well, if we're about to face that, then perhaps it will begin to shift the debate within Britain. So, the question is, is it possible to build a European strategy given all of these obstacles? And of course, I haven't gone into the, the problem of the British media, the extent to which uh, we have a national media uh, which is owned quite substantially by offshore Australian and other sources who are deeply antagonistic to the whole European integration project, the Murdoch Press in particular because of the threat of media regulation, um, and uh, that that also makes it much more difficult for a government to change the nature of the public debate unless it were to invest a great deal of political capital in <laughs> trying to alter the character of that debate. It was one of the greatest failures of the Blair government that they didn't try to reshape the national narrative, that Tony Blair came in saying, I'm going to take Britain to the heart of Europe, and invested a certain amount of effort to start with, with his partisan uh, counterparts on the continent, but was fairly rapidly distracted from that by the glamour of Washington and the illusion that Britain could act as a bridge between the United States and Europe, pursuing the special relationship. And if you look at, of, at how much he invested his time, spending much more time wooing the Americans at the cost of keeping on board with our German and French and other counterparts. Close alliance with the Murdoch press, uh, very successful. Uh, there were indeed rumours that part of that alliance was that he would not be too publicly enthusiastic about Europe. None of us know whether there was ever such a formal arrangement, but informally it was a constraint on how the Labour government presented uh, itself. Another major obstacle now is that the political class has lost prestige within Britain. Most of all in the last year, when the Daily Telegraph has mounted this extremely successful campaign uh, against parliamentarians on parliamentary expenses. There have indeed been some pretty awful cases, um, but only actually for a minority, and the Telegraph has managed extraordinarily well to dribble this out over a very long period uh, so that the enormous bonuses that bankers have taken uh, from um, the boom years are almost off the newspapers and the peccadilloes of politicians are there on the, in the headlines almost every day. That, however, makes it much more difficult for political leaders to persuade 
a deeply skeptical and alienated public that they should think about the world in a different way. I think that the outcome of the next election will partly be influenced by those who do not vote at all and turnout may well be low. It may also be the case that more independents may be elected. I was talking to an old friend uh, the other evening who was deeply engaged in trying to mount independents in particular seats, Martin Bell. Um, and um, there will be those who will vote for anyone except the above. So UKIP and the BNP will attract the discontented vote. Uh, again, Britain is not alone in all of this. Uh, disillusion with politics, switching away from conventional political parties, uh, represents a similar phenomenon across many of the EU member states. However, there are some positive constraints on any government. And let me try and express what I think any government that comes in after next May will have to tackle with. First of all, the very clear signals from Washington that they do not want Britain to stay isolated from Europe, that they disapproved. These messages were, Conservative MPs have told me, very clearly given to the Conservatives when visiting Washington, including some rather aggressive questions about who their new allies are in the European Parliament. So the logic of European partnership is close. The, there are many within the Conservative Party who look, want to resist that logic, but Cameron and those immediately around him understand, I think, the way it is. Let me tell you a little about the Conservative Party because I think it's important on, on this. Cameron is very much a pragmatist. My impression is that he's not enormously interested in foreign policy. That the importance of the European issue in him becoming leader was that his commitment to a Eurosceptic position neutralised the right wing and gave him support from the right wing. But it's not a deeply held principle for him, let alone an ideological belief. William Hague, I think, is rather different, and he is, after all, a former leader and the foreign policy spokesman. Um, he made a great deal of play when he was the leader of the party uh, with saving Britain from the European threat, indeed mounting a, a campaign about 10 days to save the pound in the middle of an election campaign, and has not informed himself about the European dimension. I read some of his recent speeches. I was very struck that in a major, what he billed as a major speech on foreign policy, he mentioned China 15 times, India 10 times, France once, and Germany not at all. Um, a large hole in the middle of, uh, of the foreign policy, if you like. And then alongside them are those within the Conservative Party who hold to a deeply Eurosceptic position. The ideologues uh, in the European Foundation, the Taxpayers' Alliance, all of those right-wing bodies who recycle the idea of the European Union taking Britain's money. Um, one of the interesting parts in the Eurobarometer poll was that if, if people are asked, how much of British GNP do you think is transferred to the European Union in contributions to the budget, the average was 3 to 5%. And there are those who think that it's 30% of British GNP which goes to the European budget. So the myths are out there in Britain. I'm glad to say you, I know you don't have myths about Europe in, in Ireland, uh, but we certainly have them uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, so a pragmatic Cameron will find himself, to, to a, quite a degree, trapped by a Eurosceptic party as well as a Eurosceptic press. And it would be a huge challenge to any conservative-led government as to how to get round the problem of the ideologues. And because he has not wanted to address the issue, the Conservative Party has not really discussed what its foreign policy should be. A, um, a senior MP from another European country who came to see me some weeks ago came to talk to us just after talking to the Conservative 
Foreign Affairs team. And the first remark he made was, they're very ignorant about the European Union. And now that, that is worrying. Not all of them. There are those uh, who have done a little bit of homework, but he was talking about their European spokesman. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there are some problems there. Uh, so constraints. First of all, positively, the United States is no longer an alternative. The Conservative Party thought they had a good foreign policy. They were going to be as close to the Bush administration as possible. But unfortunately, the Bush administration is not there. Secondly, there is this huge crisis in defense. And if we are forced to cut, the logic very strongly, and one hears people within the Ministry of Defense and within the armed services saying this, is closer collaboration with the French. If we can only afford one aircraft carrier rather than two, it makes sense to come to an agreement with the French, who also have one large aircraft carrier, about what you might do alternatively in terms of foreign postings. So that, again, the logic is very strong there, and the Americans are no longer that interested in the British uh, providing a smaller number of forces alongside an American effort, except as part of a European effort. Very striking, again, incidentally, that we are there in Helmand, and if you read the British press, we are there in Helmand on our own. If you talk to British military officers, we are there with some rather impressive Danes, Dutch, and Estonians, um, working as part of an integrated force. We don't give the narrative back, unfortunately, to our own people. Um, it's also on board that Britain has to collaborate with other countries on a range of other issues, on climate change, on migration, on border controls. We're doing our best to tighten our border controls, but those in the game understand that we can't do this on our own, and that the most obvious partners are our neighbors, and, and our neighbors institutionally through the European Union. And that takes one on to uh, an awareness of the need to rebuild links with the Netherlands, with France, with Germany, and elsewhere. So um, we are stuck with a range of pressures pushing us in contradictory direct directions. Uh, a very strongly established skeptical national narrative, but a range of understandings for those concerned with foreign policy about what it is no longer possible for Britain to do on its own. The conservative response of November the 4th, once the Lisbon Treaty was ratified, therefore, is very interesting. And again, let me say here more broadly about the Conservatives. In some ways, it is a great advantage to British politics that we have so far avoided having a large and successful hard-right nationalist party, that the Conservative Party has managed to contain most of the nationalists within a broad right-of-centre-to-right coalition, that the BNP has not made much progress so far, that UKIP has come up and come down, but does well in European elections and hasn't yet made much uh, to root itself in domestic <coughs> national politics. But of course, that's a, a huge strain for the Conservative Party, and holding that together uh, when Cameron is very much pitching for the centre, pitching for the people who've been voting for my party, and therefore wanting to be warm on climate change, uh, progressive on a whole range of issues, and balancing, therefore, between the, the, the negative nationalism and the positive messages he wishes to get across. Cameron's response to the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty was, I think, surprising. And from the point of view of people interested in intelligent British foreign policy, very positive. He said, no, we will not have a referendum. He's kicked the referendum off into the distant future. If there are major transfers of power from the United Kingdom to the European Union in the future, then we will have a referendum. But there's no point in having a referendum on a, a range of other issues between now and then. And to start with, he's got away with that. And crucially, The Sun, the leading Murdoch newspaper for these purposes, pushed out an editorial the following day supporting the line he had taken. 
rather surprisingly, no doubt some homework had been done before. The kind editor of The Sun lunches with David Cameron on a regular basis. Um, what else did he feel he needed to say? He talked about a sovereignty bill with some very loose language about the German constitutional court and its defense of German sovereignty and how we needed to defend British sovereignty. I, I think that's a hostage to fortune, uh, partly because the hardline nationalists will want to take a view on British sovereignty comparable to that which the right-wingers on the US Supreme Court have taken, that international law as a whole cannot override British domestic law, and that takes you down a very dangerous road. And of course, if you do start to unpick the supremacy of European law, you start to unpick uh, the single market as such. Uh, he then went on to talk about uh, opting out of the social chapter. Helen and I have been discussing what he means by this and how far they can negotiate on it and have come to the conclusion that you can do something on the working time directive, but it's very difficult to know how much further you go on that. Again, general comments on criminal justice. <clears throat> It's a sop to those who think that the European arrest warrant is a threat to British sovereignty, um, but that, that will need defining much more carefully if they find themselves in government as to how they ring fence British sovereignty and criminal justice without losing out uh, from the extent to which the British police recognise and know that they need cooperation with the European continent. But, he has said very clearly, Clearly, there will be no unilateral decisions, and we will negotiate these. So the likely outcome is probably that we will hope to have uh, another protocol, like the Czech protocol, attached to the next accession treaty, say, for Croatia, and that will manage to avoid a referendum. Will this satisfy the Eurosceptics inside or outside the Conservative Party? We don't know at the moment. It certainly won't satisfy the irreconcilables, we don't yet know what a new generation of Conservative MPs after a very large turnover will think of this. How much, as Cameron argues, preoccupation with reviving the British economy and with getting public spending under control will distract people from the European issue, or how far the European issue has the great ideological issue of the hard right at the present moment will take them back in a different way. Last comment. What sort of a strategy is needed? Well, I think one talks to people in the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence and elsewhere, they'd give you a, a rough list. Um, we need to revive the European Security and Defence Initiative. Um, a recent very good report from the Institute of Public Policy Research, chaired by George Robertson and Paddy Ashdown, says very clearly, Britain should commit itself to a pioneer group within the EU on closer collaboration in European defence with France, the Dutch, the Danes, the Nordics, the countries with whom we have worked on operations over the last 10 years and move ahead, uh, if necessary, on our own. We should, whichever party is in power, rebuild party links across the European Union uh, and Alongside that, we build bilateral political and governmental links. Conservatives are just beginning to become aware of how much they have damaged themselves by cutting themselves out of the EPP network, um, not just within the European Parliament, but, upon, but among party leaders as well. That we need to invest in shared foreign policy. Indeed, William Hague on occasions has, has, has demanded that Europe should have a tougher line on Russia or that Europe should have a tougher line on a range of other things, not actually appreciating, or so it seems, that demanding that Europe has a more united policy is not entirely uh, going along with his own more sceptical view of other areas. And clearly, any new government is going to have to manage domestic opinion, it's going to have to persuade domestic opinion that European cooperation is actually in Britain's interest and has got to provide some sort of modified narrative uh, which can lock the country in to coping with a European Union which is no longer federalist uh, but which does serve a number of useful 
purposes for us. Is that deliverable? I don't know. Of course, a great deal will depend on whether the Conservatives have a, a large majority in the next election or simply emerge as the largest party without a majority, a quite possible outcome, um, and of also how deep the economic crisis is and how much that has to be the overriding preoccupation of the new government. There is, of course, uh, one seductive thought that if one wants to overcome the deep Euroscepticism of the British, perhaps a Conservative government could do it more effectively than the Labour government on the parallel of Nixon going to China um, and that a, a practical and deeply unideological David Cameron might want to shift his party along those lines. But he'd have an awful battle with his party if he does that and would risk losing many of them to UKIP and perhaps even the BNP. Thank you. Thank you.